All right, picking up from the last video, um, we were talking about property rights and the spectrum of capitalism and socialism. So when we look at the real world, we don't see one extreme or the other. We see mixed economies. And that means that there is socialism on one extreme, but doesn't exist in the real world. There's capitalism on the other extreme, but it doesn't exist in the real world. So countries are in between. If we were to look at some countries, we'd say, well, say the US, you know, Sweden, Denmark, Canada, France, Germany, they're all over here. They're on the capitalist side uh, with a lot of property rights granted to individuals. Uh, whereas if we look at North Korea, Venezuela, um, you know, some of the Central American, African and African countries, they're more over here in the socialist area where there's less uh, private property, more public ownership of uh, things. But it's a spectrum and it can change over time. You know, a country could start out uh, very capitalist and move towards socialism. Um, a country could start out socialist and move towards capitalist. So it is a dynamic kind of process, but no doubt uh, economies are mixed in the real world. The next institution I want to talk about is decision making. Okay? That is who kind of allocates the resources. And to understand this, we want to talk about rationality again. Remember that rationality implies people make decisions to better their situation, not worsen it. Rational actors are always trying to improve their situation, but that doesn't mean that they have all the information necessary to do such. So we say that individuals' rationality is bounded, bounded by the limited information that they possess. And they have to get this information. And to do that, they incur transaction costs. Okay? So if you're going to buy a car, for example, the decision to buy a car might be a rational one for you because you believe having the car is going to be a better decision for you than not having the car. But you have to go out and collect information before you buy the car, right? You've got to go on to the websites and look at the different models. Maybe you need to go into the blue book and look at the different valuations for the, the car so you don't overpay. You have to go to the lot and, and look at the car and take time. And so there's all these transaction costs just to get the information necessary to make the decision that will uh, improve your situation. Uh, the higher the transaction costs, the more likely people are to use rules or habits or best practices to guide their decision making. And this is because when we have habits, we save on transaction costs. Okay, If you're buying your first car, then you don't have any habits uh, to lead you towards uh, making a good decision. But if you're buying your sixth or seventh car, you have habits, you know, you kind of know where to go for the information. You already know a lot about the different models of cars just by being alive, you know, for a longer period. And so over time, we, we develop these um, skills to lower our transaction costs. Okay? Same thing applies for, you know, when you first go to a restaurant. Right? You don't know anything about that restaurant. So to make a good decision, you got to go and collect a lot of information. Your transaction costs are high. But as you continue to go back to that restaurant, you have a habit and you now know a lot more about what you're going to get with that decision. So it lowers the transaction costs on subsequent um, visits. All right, organizational decision making. So decisions are rarely made in the context of one individual. They're instead made in the context of multiple individuals. So we call any, any uh, environment where multiple individuals are making decisions, an organization. Okay? And it could be as simple as a household, right, where decisions are made uh, for the benefit of the household, or it could be something as big as a nation, where the organization is um, the government and the, the entirety of the citizens of that country. Organizational decision making can be associational or hierarchical. Associational means there is a superior, there is no superior subordinate relationship. So this might be a partnership where each person has an 
kind of equal vote in making decisions. In contrast, a hierarchical organization has a superior subordinate relationship. This is much more common and generally considered more efficient. Okay? When you look at um, decisions being made by partnerships, um, you might have a hard time coming to an agreement. It might take longer to make decisions or you may not be able to get things done because you're, there's uh, some sort of impasse. Whereas with a superior subordinate relationship, the superior makes the decisions and the subordinates accept those decisions. So that's much more common. You see it in households where there's usually uh, kind of the leader of a household or leaders of a household that have um, control over others. Uh, obviously the parents versus the kids, that kind of thing. Corporations, right? Corporations, you have uh, the shareholders determine a board of directors who determine a management team. You have a clear hierarchy. Uh, and government. Government operates with a superior subordinate relationship. The best example, of course, would be uh, the military. Now let's talk about decision making in a hierarchical structure. There is the potential in such an environment for a principal agent problem. The principal is the one that has the controlling authority and they engage an agent to act on their behalf. The agent therefore acts on behalf of the principal. If I hire you as an employee, I am the principal that is employing you as an agent to represent me. And as a result, I hope that you will represent me and act in a way that aligns with my objective. Opportunistic behavior is the opposite of that, where the agent doesn't act in the principal's best interests, they act in their own best interest. And this could be illustrated with the employee uh, that maybe shirks, right? Shirking is not doing your job, being lazy, that kind of thing. So if I hire you to work for me and my goal is to maximize profit, I need you to work hard. I need you to show up on time. I need you to be nice to customers. That's my objective and you are an agent to pursue that objective on my behalf. That's why I pay you. But if you choose not to do that, if you're rude to customers, you show up late and or you don't work hard, then you're acting in your own best interest at my expense. You are engaging in opportunistic behavior. The principal agent problem is always present because of the conflicting interest that would exist between a principal and an agent. But it's a matter of degree. And the degree to which the opportunistic behavior occurs, that is to which the agent acts in their own best interest instead of the principal's, is in part a result of how effective the um, principal incentivizes the agent to act in his or her best interest. So if I pay you a good salary, if I give you bonuses based on maximizing profit and being nice to customers and showing up on time, I am mitigating the opportunistic behavior that you would otherwise be incentivized to take. So one way to think about this is good management is a way of dealing with the principal agent problem. This problem doesn't just emerge between employer and employee. It emerges in any principal agent relationship, in any hierarchy. So it could be as simple as you ask your roommate to go shopping for you, right? They say, hey, I'm going to the store. And you say, hey, here's 20 bucks. Could you pick something up for me? Well, they're now your agent and you're the principal. Are they going to represent your best interest or are they going to act in their own best interest? Um, that be the question. Asymmetric information is another issue that emerges in decision making. This is where one party, typically the agent, has more information than another party, typically the principal and they use that to their advantage. Imagine again that I'm the principal and I employ you to work for my business. Say I own a coffee shop and I want you to engage in good customer service. Well, as long as I'm there with you in the coffee shop, then I can see if you're being nice to customers. So you and I have the same information about how you're treating customers. That's symmetric information, right? 
I'm the principal, you're the agent, I want you to be nice to customers, and I can see if you're being nice to customers. So you have the same information that I have. And as a result, you cannot engage in opportunistic behavior. However, if I leave the store, which I typically will if I'm the business owner, and leave you on your own, now you actually have more information about how you treat customers than I do. I don't, I'm not there, so I don't know if you're nice to the customers or if you're rude to the customers. You do. That asymmetric information allows you to effectively take advantage of me. It allows you to relax your customer service, right? Um, and it harms me. But I can't do anything about it because I left the store. Now, asymmetric information is all around us. That's just one example. Another one would be if I'm selling you a car, I know a lot about that car. You don't. What if I know that the transmission is bad? You don't know that. So I might be able to take advantage of that asymmetry of information by charging you a higher price than you would otherwise pay if you knew the transmission was bad. So that asymmetry creates a problem in uh, for for you of course in both cases whether it's an employer that has to deal with less information than the employee or it's a car buyer that has to deal with less information than the car seller you have to bridge that information gap as the employer i might put cameras in the business right or i might have customers fill out a survey telling me how nice you were See what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to make the information more symmetric so that you as the agent cannot take advantage of me. Similarly with the car, you know, you might have a mechanic look over that car before you buy it so that now you have the information that I have and don't overpay for a car with a bad transmission. There's actually two types of asymmetric information. The first is called moral hazard. And this type of asymmetry occurs after the relationship is formed, okay? The agent engages in behavior that creates greater risk to the principal after the relationship. Example would be workers, the agent, meet the manager's principal's quotas by cutting product quality and not telling them. You see, if the managers can't tell if the quality that the workers are producing is good or bad, then the workers can produce bad quality and not work as hard, right? Corporate executives, agents, hand out lucrative bonuses without the shareholder principal knowing. If corporate executives are able to get extra money without the shareholders finding out about it, then they can do that. In both cases, the, the manager or the principal do not have the information necessary to prevent that opportunistic behavior, to prevent the workers from cutting the quality or the corporate executives from getting the bonuses. Moral hazard. Notice the relationship had already been formed when this happened. The worker was already employed by the manager and the corporate executives were already employed by the shareholders. Adverse selection, in contrast, occurs before the relationship is formed. This is where the agent engages in behavior that creates greater risk to the principal. So same idea, right? But it's before the relationship. And this usually occurs when a uh, relationship is potential, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. So a job applicant exaggerates his qualifications in a job interview. You know, when you go into a job interview, you know more about your true qualifications than the principal does. And so if you can exaggerate that, you can make yourself look better. But if you're exaggerating it, it means that you don't really have those qualifications, but your employer, your potential employer doesn't know that. So that's why sometimes employers get bad employees that look really good on paper. A highly competent worker conceals her true competency to avoid greater responsibility. Um, in some cases, uh, you might be a really good worker, but you don't want your supervisor to know that because they'll give you more responsibility. I saw that a lot when I worked in the food industry where you had some people that they didn't want to be shift leaders. They wanted to stay crew members because they didn't want that extra responsibility. 
so they would conceal their true abilities to prevent getting that higher position. All right, we'll pick up there in the next video. Thanks, guys.